we're going to show you the biceps in transverse and longitudinal. You always start in the bicipital groove. On the less, less, uh, left side of the picture is the lesser tuberosity, on the right, right side the greater tuberosity. Line them up nicely, biceps bright in the middle, make the bone bright and you slowly go distally. Keep the tendon nicely in the middle until you reach the level of the uh, pectoralis major, which is the tendon coming from the left. And that's the musculotendinous junction, you see the muscle coming up there underneath the pectoralis, musculotendinous junction of the biceps. You go back proximally, keep the biceps nicely in the middle, until you're back in the bicipital groove. It's a good place to spin, so if you do it slowly, keep the tendon in the middle, and you can slowly spin it until you see the longitudinal fibers of the biceps coming in. Make sure the distal part of your probe gets pushed in, so the tendon gets nicely lined up with the surface, so you get a nice, nice bright fibular pattern of the biceps. Then we go back to transverse. Now we line it up again, uh, the left lesser and greater tuberosity, and go straight up, lesser tuberosity falls away, then turn your probe so the greater tuberosity also falls away, come up and over, and then you're in the rotator cuff interval. So there's a parallel band of tissue with the biceps in the middle floating in that soft tissue. On the left side of the biceps is the subscapularis, on the lat lateral side the supraspinatus. Then we go back slowly, reverse it back to the occipital groove. And now we're going to look at the subscapularis. To do that, we ask the patient to external rotate the arm slowly. So the subscapularis comes into view with the longitudinal fibers of the tendon. And you can move the probe medially and you identify the coracoid process as your landmark. And you can also see the musculotendinous junction of the subscapularis. Then we move back laterally. And this is a good place to, to spin on to see that uh, subscapularis in transverse and we slowly do that there and then you get what's called the tiger striping appearance of the subscapularis in transverse and then we come back into longitudinal and that's the subscapularis and we go back to where we started which is the cross section of the biceps in the bicipital groove and that's where we stop to scan supraspinatus it's very important to get the patient position correct we don't use the crass or semi-crass position. We just need to make sure that the form, forearm is neutral so the hand isn't on the leg and we bring the elbow into as much extension as you require to ensure that you can see enough of supraspinatus. What we then do is we find the long head of biceps sitting within the bicipital groove. The next thing we do to get a transverse image of supraspinatus is to come laterally round the arm to bring the long head of biceps to the side of the screen. We're then going to heel the probe in to get the long head of biceps to the bottom of the hill, which is the greater tuberosity. Carefully scanning the shape of the bone, ensuring that the bone is kept nice and bright, we bring the probe up and over to visualize the supraspinatus in transverse section, trying to keep the bone bright and seeing a nice parallel band of tendon. So here we can see the supraspinatus in cross section with the long head of biceps to the left. As we come round the back, we can see the change in fiber orientation, which is the infraspinatus in long section. Over the top, we have the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. It's important to visualize all the way through the tendon coming up and over to see all the fibers, particularly on the footprint. To find a longitudinal section of supraspinatus, we simply spin on the tendon, bring the greater tuberosity into the middle of the screen. Now it's important to find out where we are on the tendon and to find that out, we must push the probe forward until we go into the bicipital groove. So the greater tuberosity falls away and the biceps comes in long section. That means we know that we're in long section. With if we come back round laterally, we then hit the greater tuberosity. We straighten up by just towing down the probe and there we can see the longitudinal fibers of supraspinatus. Now, we need to ensure that we scan all the way through supraspinatus until we get to infraspinatus. So we scan again, feeling the shape of the bone until the tuberosity flattens out and we see a change in fiber orientation on top of the tuberosity. And that's the infraspinatus coming in over the top 
of supraspinatus in transverse section. And again, it's important to scan through supraspinatus all the way from the long head of biceps through to where infraspinatus comes in. Okay, we're going to show you the posterior shoulder, posterior superior part of the shoulder joint. You, you've, you've put the probe in across the top part of the humerus and then you look for the bony landmarks. So the arm on the right side and then you look for the glenoid and the labrum. If you external rotate your arm slowly for me, you can confirm that you're in the, at the joint line. Come back. And then if you follow the glenoid and you go a little bit more medial, then there's your spinal glenoid notch. If you external rotate it once more, you see a little blood vessel coming in there and back. Okay, so once you have those landmarks and you put the joint in the middle, then you look for the infraspinator, which is quite a nice thick intramuscular tendon. If you external rotate again, then you can see the tendon moving towards the joint and come back. That's in longitudinal. If you want to do it in cross section, you just spin on it and it's a nice intramuscular tendon and you can follow it up uh, lateral or medial. Let's go back in longitudinal and that's your starting point again. So you've got all the bony landmarks in one picture labrum, glenoid, spinal glenoid notch, and then the uh, upper arm as well. To assess the acromioclavicular joint, we have the patient relax with the arm down by the side. To palpate the acromioclavicular joint first, it's always slightly more posterior than you think, and you can just pop the um, probe on, making sure that you stabilize the probe. Over the top of that, we can see the superior capsule and the ligament. And in between the two bones is the joint itself. And that's where we can look for an intraarticular effusion. Now, when assessing the acromioclavicular joint, it's really important to look at two things. The first is the distance between the clavicle and the acromion, particularly if somebody has had a traumatic injury such as falling off their bike. You can measure that distance at the same time, you can also have a look at something called vertical laxity, which is looking at the height of the clavicle compared with the acromion. And it's important that the height of the clavicle is the same as the acromion. To assess the joint dynamically, you can use the patient's aggravating factors. So for example, if they get pain moving forwards, then you can bring the arm forwards and have a look at both of those two things we talked about. So are the bones moving apart or together? And is particularly the clavicular end moving up and down, so superior and inferiorly with the movement? You can also do a scarf test, so you must keep the AC joint nice and still, keeping the probe nice and stable, and ask the patient to bring the arm up and across their neck into a scarf position. So if you move up, to see if there's any capsular swelling between the two bones. And what you'll see is you'll see some lifting up of the capsule if there is a joint swelling. Did you find that video useful? If you did, don't worry, we've got loads more videos for you. You can like our videos, you can make a comment, you can subscribe to our channel to get all of our new videos, and you can even join our membership. Good luck scanning.